Welcome to the show. I'm State Senator Gary Holder Winfield. I represent New Haven and West Haven. Uh, and this is a show where we will be talking about issues uh, that are going on in the Capitol and trying to inform the people of New Haven, West Haven, and hopefully others who get to watch the show. My first guest is Karima Robinson. She's a tutor, a volunteer with literacy, a volunteers of Greater New Haven. How are you, Karima? Good, how are you? Thank I'm you. doing well. So Karima, uh, I know you're working on some legislation that's pretty important. Mm -hmm. uh, would you like to talk to us about what it is and why you're working on it? Sure. Um, we're working on a bill. It's RHB 5562, Section 1, and it's a bill regarding special education. Okay. And so what we're asking for is three things. One is the IEP form that students with special needs normally have to fill out or their parents or teachers fill out for them. Um, so the IEP form currently does not have uh, a section or a box that you can check for dyslexia. So that's one thing that is currently in the proposed bill that we are supporting that measure to go ahead and add a special box for dyslexia. In addition to that, we're asking that the bill be modified so that there is actually a definition of dyslexia that goes along with it because many people don't really understand what dyslexia is. Um, and a lot of teachers don't understand what it is, so they're not gonna be able to really identify it or check the box. Um, and the third thing we're asking for is for training and professional development for teachers and administrators in the public school system so that they have a better understanding of dyslexia and um, have a set of tools to help treat the students who are identified as dyslexic. And so having the box and the ability to check the box, mm -hmm. uh, is that uh, under the way you envision this working, is that something that would trigger a certain uh, response from the teachers necessarily? What, what's the purpose of the box? Is it just to inform or does it actually trigger an action? It has to trigger an action. Okay. So once that box is checked, there has to be a certain set of protocol for that individual student that's created to help that student with that disability. Okay. So there has to be something, some mechanism behind it also. Okay. Um, so the training and professional development is, is really necessary because once that student is identified as having dyslexia, there has to be a treatment plan. And, and so you were talking about modifying the bill so that uh, we would have a definition of dyslexia. Mm -hmm. And I think you're correct to say that many people don't know what it is. It's mm -hmm. something that we've heard about. Mm -hmm. uh, we may have known someone, potentially not, who had dyslexia. Mm -hmm. What is dyslexia? How would you like it to be de defined? Okay, it's, um, it's kind of a broad term. It's, it's like a sort of a broad term for a number of dis different disabilities. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a little hard to define, uh, but there is an official definition actually somewhere in the Connecticut, actually I'm not sure where it is, but there is an official definition, mm -hmm. but no one's using it right now. Okay, so, um, so you're, you're, you're not saying that you have the definition, you're just no. saying that what, what would happen is this bill would take the official definition and place that into uh, the bill as the definition of dyslexia your, your, the bill necessarily pertains to. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. But then also the training and professional development. Yeah. And a little bit on the training and professional development. So mm -hmm. when you talk about that, what does that entail? What are we talking about making sure the teachers are uh, knowledgeable about and capable of doing? Well, I think it's something that should be covered when a teacher goes to be certified or is in a teacher's college or something. There should be a curriculum that the teacher has to um, successfully pass that class or that section of that class so that they're really well informed about what dyslexia is. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about a, a curriculum that's put in place for teachers who are becoming certified and then professional development for current teachers who are already certified to teach but really don't have a working knowledge of mm -hmm. dyslexia. And so. do you imagine that, uh, I, I don't know where this bill is in the process and mm -hmm. uh, what you think about it, but do you imagine that there's opposition and if so, why and are those legitimate concerns? Um, in the hearing on Monday, there wasn't really much opposition. The only okay. thing was kind of surprise, like the... Um, that it's an issue? Surprise that it's not, it hasn't been addressed earlier. Ah, okay. Yeah, and I was actually surprised too, um, that it hasn't been addressed much earlier because, you know, back in my day, there wasn't that much information about dyslexia. Right. right. But now there is, there's a lot of information about it. And so people should be making use of that. So let me ask you, how do you come to be an advocate on this issue? I'm a volunteer, I'm a tutor for literacy volunteers, and so I've been tutoring um, adults who can't read or who have very low reading levels. Right now I'm tutoring adults who are, you know, I would say roughly in their 60s, okay. and they're at a second grade reading level. Wow. So, um, and that's pretty common. We have a lot of adults who somehow have fallen through the cracks of the system who are in New Haven and really can't read their own mail or apply for a driver's license or 
fill out medical forms and that kind of thing. So they come to us for tutoring for help with their reading. And I've noticed because I have dyslexia that they're making some of the same mistakes that I used to make when I was in elementary school. Uh. So that's how I came to be an advocate. I sort of started to see things that the students are doing and realize, oh, they have dyslexia. But I don't I have a test to prove it, but I can sort of just observe right. what they're The experience doing. allows you to see that. Yeah. 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 So um, how do you go from being an advocate in the general sense to being at the state capitol? That's a big leap for most people. <laughs> um, it just, I mean, the literacy volunteers, I started talking to people about yes. this issue, um, my colleagues there about dyslexia. I told my students that I am dyslexic and so I can relate to what they're struggling with. And then this bill just came up. We got an email from Decoding Dyslexia, which is okay. a grassroots organization. And they were, this hearing was coming up. And so they said, oh, Karima, you should go because you're, you seem to know about dyslexia. And if you're available, you could go. So that's how I ended up here, just by sort of coincidence and hearing that there's a bill coming up and that they wanted support. They wanted people to come and support it. Wow. So is there anything going on that we should know about besides the bill or things uh, around the bill that would help to make this bill a possibility? you have any a uh, actions going on, events, anything of that nature? Um, there's one event that is not my event, but there's an event happening on April 5th, which is a Saturday morning in Stanford. And it's a former, former NFL player, Hoven Hay. Okay. I don't I follow no football, idea. so I, I have no watch idea who sports. that is. I don't have an idea. <laughs> um, but he is a former NFL player, and apparently he had a learning disability coming up. And he's also speaking with uh, Lederick Horn, who is a national disability speaker. So they're having an event for parents and children, uh, students, at the Westover Magnet School in Stanford on Saturday, April 5th, 10.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. And is there so. anything else, uh, we're going to wrap up soon, is there anything else that you would like people to know or one final pitch you would make uh, to any legislators who might actually watch the show? Um, for the legislators, I really want people to have a better understanding of dyslexia. Um, so can I just do a little quick Sure, absolutely. You got two minutes. Two minute pitch <laughs> on what dyslexia is. I've been, do, I've been reading up on it because I'm actually trying to crack my yeah. own code, like trying to figure out how to correct the problem myself sure. since I've been struggling with it for a long time. And what I've read, one of the explanations I have is that people who are dyslexic, they think in pictures. Right. So you might think um, with sounds and words. So as you're reading something, you, you hear your own voice saying those words. Mm -hmm. But as I'm reading something, I see like a movie right. happening in front of me. So if I'm reading something about, a, you know, the elephant went to the watering hole, um, I have an immediate picture of an elephant, but I don't have a picture of the word the. Right. or two. And so that's where the dyslexia kicks in and we get confused. And because these are kind of abstract words that we don't have images for, and that's what slows down the reader. And as the reader gets older, um, the, the problem becomes more apparent that this is an issue. Um, so that's one sort of just basic overview of what dyslexia, we just think differently. Right. Um, it's not like we're, there's anything wrong with us necessarily, but it's just a different process that right. we go through. Two organizations that I want to support. Uh, the first is Literacy Volunteers, and that's um, statewide, and I think it's also a nationwide organization. So we're always looking for tutors to support the organization, to be tutors, to volunteer, um, any financial contributions that people can make. Um, it really is a great organization. They do great work, and um, it's all about, you know, the money really goes into buying books for the students and, and uh, facilitating the testing that mm -hmm. goes on to make sure that they're developing. And the second organization is Decoding Dyslexia, which is a grassroots organization of uh, parents and teachers who are trying to advocate for different bills right. across the state of Connecticut. Right. I appreciate you explaining that and taking the time to come and sit with me and talk to me and educate me and hopefully some others who see the show. Um, Karima Robinson from uh, Literacy Volunteers of Greater New Haven, thank you for coming to sit with us, thank and uh, we'll be me. back shortly. Okay, great. Thank you.
Welcome back. Uh, I'm State Senator Gary Holder Winfield, and I have with me now a staff member from the Racial Profiling Project, uh, Kim Barone. How are you doing, Ken? Good. How are you? Good, good. So I hear that there's some information that you have that uh, comes out of a report that's being released. Uh, would you like to talk a little bit about that? Sure. So the Racial Profiling Prohibition Project Advisory Board released our annual progress report to the Connecticut General Assembly yesterday in which we updated the General Assembly on the uh, implementation efforts of the Alvin W. Penn Racial Profiling Law. <clears throat> the big uh, uh, piece in this report that we're reporting uh, as of yesterday when we released our report is that almost 95% of police agencies are now in compliance with the uh, Alvin Penn law that took effect October 1, 2013. Now that sounds phenomenal to me. Can you kind of help uh, the audience to understand where we were before we implemented this law? Sure. So prior to the changes being made in the 2012-2013 legislative session, um, the African American Affairs Commission was tasked with collecting uh, racial profiling data, oftentimes on paper forms um, that made it very difficult to analyze the data. And the African American Affairs Commission had previously reported that 27 police agencies uh, were annually submitting information to their commission. Wow, that's phenomenal. So as a motorist, what does this mean for me? What is the impact, the actual impact that I should see? Sure. So as a motorist, uh, whenever a law enforcement officer pulls over a vehicle in the state of Connecticut, and we have approximately 750,000 traffic stops conducted in Connecticut each year, which means that it is oftentimes the most common interaction that a citizen is going to have with law enforcement. But every time a law enforcement officer pulls over an individual, uh, the law enforcement officer is to record a, uh, a list of information about their perception of that driver. Mm -hmm. um, and they are then to report that information to the Office of Policy and Management for analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, as well as uh, recording and reporting information, each motorist as of October 1st should be receiving a three by five size index card that informs them of their right to file a complaint if they feel that they were profiled. I have a copy of the card with me. It's a three by five index card and it informs folks in both English and Spanish of their right to file a complaint uh, with the law enforcement agency that conducted the traffic stop or with the Commission on Human Rights and Opportunities. And it provides both a website and a phone number. And I think that's important in the discussions. I know that some people felt like they uh, could not uh launch a complaint or uh, or something of that nature with the police department. So it's important for people to understand that they can do it with uh, the CHRO as well. Correct. And yeah. all uh, complaints that are reported internally with a police department also have uh, the police department then has to send that complaint off to the chief state's attorney's office to do an outside uh, essentially audit to make sure that that investigation followed uh, proper state protocol. So is there anything else we should know that comes out of your report? Um, I, I think the big thing in this report is, is the high level of compliance and um, uh, the only other uh, major piece that we mentioned in this report is that uh, last month the Department of Justice came here uh, to Connecticut and they trained 30 people from around the country in uh, fair and impartial policing and 12 of those individuals that were trained um, by the Department of Justice and are now certified fair and impartial policing trainers are from Connecticut and will now be going to law enforcement agencies in Connecticut uh, to conduct this uh, uh, Department of Justice sponsored training for law enforcement. Wow. Well, that's great. Uh, and thank you for your work. And uh, thank you for stopping by to inform uh, myself and the people watching. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. My next guest is Andrew Clark, who's uh, the acting executive director of the Connecticut Sentencing Commission. How are you doing and welcome? I'm doing well, thank you. So uh, you're here to talk about Senate Bill 259, or at least the process that the Sentencing Commission went through to get to Senate Bill 259, which is near and dear to me and deals with the school drug zones. Could you talk a little bit about how uh, the Sentencing Commission came to be involved and how they came to offer their recommendations? Sure. Uh, well, the Connecticut Sentencing Commission was formed approximately three years ago. It's made up, uh, it was put in state statute, and it was made up, and it's made up of uh, judges, uh, prosecutor, public defenders, uh, law enforcement, the victim advocates, uh, there's six legislative appointees, and we work by uh, uh, virtue of consensus. So every proposal that we 
submit to the legislature is a consensus pr proposal, meaning members can either support it or live with the proposal. And one of the three proposals submitted to the legislature this year was uh, regarding the, the sentencing commission in the drug free school zones. Okay. So could you talk a little bit about what the legislation proposed actually would do and why? I, I understand a lot of people have trouble with it because it seems a little bit on the counterintuitive side of things. Right. So uh, a couple of years back, uh, the chairs of the Judiciary Committee uh, asked the Sentencing Commission to take a look at this issue. And we formed a working group of the Sentencing Commission made up of prosecutors, public defender, and drug policy experts. And we wanted to uh, look in great detail about what Connecticut had proposed in the past, why this law came on the books in the first place, and try to make some sense and come up with a proposal. So what we found was that back in the late 80s, uh, approximately, uh, there was a big epidemic of uh, uh, crack cocaine use. And there was this fear that that was bleeding into schools and kids were being preyed upon and the like. And so the federal government created a, a thousand foot zone around schools and essentially wanted to make a point to say, you will not, we will not allow selling, uh, possession of drugs around these uh, schools, and therefore we're going to create a law with an enhanced penalties. Of course, there are laws like that already on the books for sure. selling to children and the like, but this was an enhanced penalty in that particular zone. So that's how it started in Connecticut. It morphed over time. It then included daycares, it then started, it included public housing. It went from 1,000 feet to 1,500 feet. Um, it wasn't entirely clear whether that was from a point in the property or the whole perimeter of the property, where do you measure the 1,500 feet from? And what we found was that there was just a lot of confusion um, about the law uh, in terms of how to apply it, and as well as the, the places where arguably most of the drug sales occur out in the open cities, uh, it had the effect of blanketing the whole city with a drug-free zone, which had no deterrent effect. It essentially said to someone, uh, it didn't make sense, it didn't matter if you were selling on the doorstep of a school or at the Travelers Building in downtown Hartford, right. you're going to get the same penalty. So we didn't think that's what the legislature was intending, so we made the proposal to say um, 200 feet from the perimeter of the property uh, is where you measure the zone from, and that's where you say that this is a sanctuary, this is a safe zone where we do not want uh, sales or possession of drugs. Right. And that makes perfect sense to me. We have very little bit of time left. The other two proposals would be? A juvenile sentence uh, modification, and that was uh, responding to Supreme Court decisions regarding juveniles' culpability uh, in terms of uh, being treated as adults in the adult system and needing a, a, a second look, uh, essentially requiring a second look at some point down in their sentence. Right as to their ability to change and be rehabilitated. And the final, what, the, what was that the final two? No, the, the final one is one called Certificates of uh, Employability or Rehabilitation. Right. Essentially, that's dealing with the collateral consequences of conviction. Uh, as uh, many of your constituency would, I'm sure, fairly well be aware of, once you get a criminal record right. that holds you from back from doing a lot of things, and employment is one of them, uh, and this uh, aims to address that. Well, Andrew Clark from the Connecticut Sentencing Commission, thank you very much for coming. Thank you for joining me to talk about some of the issues that are important to uh, my constituency and to you, whether you're a part of the constituency or not. And we'll be back next time to talk about some really important issues. We don't know what they are yet, but they will be important. And uh, this is a new adventure for me. It's a new adventure for you. So thank you for joining us.